Let's move on to tonight's speaker. She's a good friend of mine. We've uh, been friends for a number of years. I try to remember how long, but I completely failed at that, Cheryl. I have no idea if you know, but not too important. But uh, Cheryl has moved down here, or moved down here from uh, Snowy, Vermont, she says, uh, over 20 years ago. And uh, she gladly uh, substituted all of her uh, 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 winter gardening for skiing and uh, skating that she enjoyed up north, but now she can spend her time outside doing some gardening. So she's a very happy gardener in this area. Uh, she joined the Arboretum very quickly when she moved here and just became a very active volunteer. And she enjoys gardening uh, based upon some of the plants she's gotten here at the Arboretum through the years. And she herself likes to test the envelope and to see what she can grow. And as with many of us, I'm sure has had many failures. She has a great herd of deer that take care of her yard uh, quite significantly. <laughs> I think you have some uh, friends over here in the audience. And uh, to sh uh, Cheryl does share her passion of horticulture with a lot of people. She's taught classes at Wake Tech for a number of years. So she's owned a landscape business. And uh, she's spent many uh, hours volunteering at the Arboretum. And we do owe her a big thanks for the newsletter, of course. She's one of my uh, proofreading helpers, so I greatly appreciate that. And she's a member of the Board of Advisors here at the Arboretum, but she's also a member of the Board of Advisors for the Magnolia Society International. And she's the editor for their journal. And she brought several journals over here for you to look at. But those are her personal collection. So she'd like to take those home with her when she goes tonight. So uh, go ahead and leave those up with her. And uh, what she did not have in her bio is that uh, she worked at the Atlantic Avenue Lawn and Garden Center with me for a number of years. And I forget how long that was, but it was a long time in itself. And that was a lot of fun working with her. So she's been a, a, a good force in my life in horticulture. And I greatly appreciate that. And uh, I really can't remember, but I think she's actually the one who got me more interested in the Arboretum. Um, uh, through conversations that we had at the Garden Center, so I definitely appreciate that. We can at least owe part of me being here to Cheryl. So thank you very much for that, Cheryl, and thanks for being tonight's guest speaker. That's quite an introduction to move up to. Can you all hear me? No. No. You want to stand behind the microphone, Cheryl? That will probably catch you better. Yeah. Is that better? Is it awesome? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Chris. Um, I didn't realize that I introduced Chris to the Arboretum, so uh, I'm glad I did. Some years ago, I was invited to take a new position with the Magnolia Society International and expand my love of gardening through magnolias. I was telling somebody here tonight that the first time I ever saw a magnolia, because I grew up in Zone 3, was when I was in my early 20s in England, where I was working at the time, and I walked down the hillside, um, just planted with a load of, of what I think, probably looking back, were magnolia solanogena of some sort. And I was, I was just overwhelmed with them. They were beautiful. Nothing else was in bloom, hardly. And it was just a stunning view down this slope of, um, of magnolias. And I thought, wow, what is that? I, I need that. Um, I didn't have my own garden for some years after that, but it was certainly one of the first, the, one of the very first plants that I planted in my garden in North Carolina. In fact, number three was Betty, magnolia, Betty. So uh, magnolias have always been a love of mine, but I didn't have any idea the extent of magnolias until I joined the Magnolia Society and then was invited to take over as editor. So through being an editor, it's, it's really opened my world. And when Chris asked me for a title for this talk, I just said, oh, I don't know, Magnolias for the Southeast. This was a few months ago. And then I began to think, well, you know, there are a lot of people who could talk to you with much more expertise probably about the science of magnolias for the Southeast and how to grow them and so forth. So I thought, well, what, how am I going to do this talk? And I thought, well, I have a very unique position as editor of the journal. The journals are up here for you to take a look at. Yes, I do want to take them home. Um, but they are a publication that comes out twice a year to the membership. It is a highly quoted in the horticultural world. 
uh, publication, and it's not peer reviewed, but it's a, a step or two below that. So it's, it does have a very um, good following. The Magnolia Society International truly is international. I have met people and worked with people from all over the world, um, including, believe it or not, North Africa, um, Dubai, I think we had a request from somebody there as to what magnolia she could grow. And I had to guess that the two people from Dubai and Egypt were expats who'd gone over to work and maybe wanted magnolias in their garden. It's good for them. Um, but I, I have worked literally with people from Cuba and um, Russia and Colombia, South America, and of course, Europe and Asia, New Zealand, Australia, so all over the world, really. And it has been a lot of fun for me. I love working with people, and I love the plants, and I have learned so much in the five years that I have done this that it's, it's just been amazing. The other thing I've gotten to do is travel, and so I'm going to take you um, on some armchair travel for the first part of this talk to various parts around the United States. The, the board of directors meets twice a year, once in front of the annual meeting, and then we meet separately in the fall. And so we travel to wherever that is and, and have seen a lot of magnolias and magnolia-related gardens in many places, and I'll show you some of them. So we're going to start off by armchair traveling to a part of South China, southwest China that has really not been very well explored. And so a group from the, a group from the uh, San Francisco Botanic Garden and the San Francisco Parks and Recreation went out a couple of years ago as a guest of a uh, researcher in China who's been doing a lot of work with magnolias and nothing else. She specializes in magnolias. They found a native growing group of Magnolia zinii, and this is really rare because the International Union of Conservation of Nature in 2007 produced a red list of magnolias. The red list of magnolias talks about the magnolias in how critically, anywhere from critically endangered to nearly extinct to we don't need to worry about these, we have plenty. Um, so Magnolia zinii is actually listed as critically endangered. Part of it is because where it was growing in China, a lot of people, the population has grown so that they are either cutting the trees for lumber or they are just cutting them out so they can make farmland or housing developments. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. So to see Magnolia zinii in the wild was a real treat for these people, and I asked David Bruce Pickler, who was on the trip, if I could borrow a couple of his slides, and he said, oh yes, go ahead and use them. Show them to as many people as you can. So this is his picture of Magnolia zinii in, in southwest China, where they haven't done much development yet. On the right is Magnolia cytostellata, and this has been separated from Magnolia stellata, which we know as the Japanese uh, uh, species. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is that the Magnolia Journal has now published, in the five years that I've been doing it, six new magnolias, or separated magnolias, and we've, uh, we've republished two that were published in a very small German uh, Italian publication. So Magnolia Journal is, is really um, becoming important in the, in the world of horticulture, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be a big part of that, or small part of it, really. <laughs> so getting back to the journals, um, you get, as a member, you get two of these a year, and what I try to do is find a cover that is related to, this, to a story within the journal. So all the pictures on the cover are from a story from that particular issue of the journal. And it, this represents our membership, because on the far right is a new hybrid done by a retired English teacher who moved to Richmond, Virginia. He has a very small plot in downtown Richmond, so what he 
does or did, um, was connect with Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden. And he, they gave him a whole huge area in one of their back fields to use. Well, he did so much hybridizing in his retirement that they finally said, Bill, we don't have room for you anymore. Mm -hmm. So what he, they said, you, you've got to farm these out. We can't plant hundreds of your plants anymore. We just don't have the room. Mm -hmm. So he brought them to some growers, among them down here in North Carolina, one of whom is a friend of mine. And so through that, I have about 20 of his hybrids. And the thing about these is, from seed to bloom time, you better be very patient because they can take up to 20 years. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you go into a garden center and you're not gonna wait 20 years because nobody in their right mind is gonna buy a plant they're gonna wait 20 years for. So they're grafted, and in our area, most of them are grafted onto magnolia cobus roots. And, and then, of course, they're ready to bloom very when you get them. In the middle, is a Magnolia Dolt Sopa from India. It's also found in China. Um, but this is a picture that Nick Macer of Pan Global Plants in Gloucestershire, England took. He does a lot of exploring in, China, in India with a friend of his. And for him, he says that there are so many plants that are still not discovered or named in, in the parts of India that he goes to that he, he goes as often as he can. So yeah. this is Magnolia Don't Sopa, taken on a windy day, but I just thought that picture was absolutely gorgeous. Um, the last one represents a home gardener who got a Magnolia Biloba to, to blossom with this beautiful red bloom. This is really, really rare. He got it through the seed exchange of the Magnolia Society and it blossomed with this red. Normally, Biloba is a white blossom. I've never seen a red one, nobody else had. So this really took the magnolia world by storm and everybody was talking about it. So we featured that on, on the cover when he um, introduced it as a uh, new plant. On the back of the magnolia journals, we have another picture uh, that is, and this may be subtle, subtle for some of my members, but that's okay. We take a picture from a future article, so the next journal. And in this case, our own Mark Wethington was going to do an article on the collection here at the Arboretum, and one of his favorites is Magnolia stellata chrysanthemiflora, which is up here in the um, garden. So uh, he gave me this picture, and we used this on the back of the journal, knowing that we would publish his article in the next um, issue. So traveling, uh, most of the traveling that I have, well, all of the traveling that I have done so far with Magnolia Society has been within the United States. I'll be going to Poland in uh, two months, and that, that's for our annual meeting <coughs> this year. But St. Louis was where it all started 52 years ago. So two years ago, we had our 50th anniversary in St. Louis, and of course, it was fun to see the arch. And it was even more fun to see Missouri Botanic Garden. How many of you have been to Missouri Botanic Garden? How many of you have Googled and found Missouri to Botanic Garden with a reference? Yeah, well, um, they associate with Kew Gardens. So a lot of your references are done for America from, from here. And if you ever get a chance to go, those of you who haven't, it is a huge garden. Their facilities are fantastic. The research uh, is, is just wonderful. So, um, and the art, I mean, it just answers all the, the the wants that you would have as a gardener. So beautiful, beautiful garden. I could have spent days here, not just four hours. We did San Francisco a few years ago. It's not always bright and sunny, as you see this bridge usually portrayed, believe me. And we went to the Japanese tea garden, which is the oldest tea garden in the United States actually built or developed by a Japanese landscape designer and maintained by him. As with many of the trees, they're very sculptured, very um, carefully pruned so that they are sculptured. They're very old. Uh, this was, garden was started in the 1930s, I believe. And the magnolias, we were lucky they were in bloom at this time, but absolutely gorgeous. And they look really old. One of the other treats I had was to go to the Morton Arboretum in Chicago. 
it was a treat to like turn kind of like this weekend. We got there on Friday afternoon. It was lovely, really beautiful. Had a nice tour of the Arboretum. Uh, the next day we met all day in the library, no problem. Sunday we were offered uh, a tour of the uh, Chicago Botanic Garden and the temperature just the, dropped out of the bottom. Oh my gosh, I don't think I've ever been so cold. Um, so this was quite a, an experience being in Chicago in, November, in October. But this is the library windows in the uh, Morton Arboretum. Absolutely beautiful. And because the librarian knew we were coming, she'd gotten out a whole bunch of references on Magnolia. Some of them were so old and so um, carefully preserved that we couldn't touch them. They were under glass. Um, but these, we could flip through some of these. This is a, actually one that does very well in England, but not so well on the East Coast. Uh, California can grow it, but this is um, uh, Magnolia Cambellii. Beautiful pictures. And then last year we went to North Georgia and used the University of Georgia as our base mm -hmm. for going around to various gardens. This is a private garden and we often do this in some of our um, annual meetings. We go to both private and public gardens. This is the home of Coach Vince Dooley and his wife Barbara. They are used to entertaining 100, 200 people at a time. This is their back patio, or part of it. Um, and, oops. This is Mrs. Dooley here, Barbara. She's one of these people who's never met anybody she didn't love immediately. She's so much fun to be with. Um, you'll recognize, perhaps, Jared Barnes. This is Greg Page, who's going to be part of that program uh, from Bartlett uh, of the Plant Explorers Evening. And he is currently our Vice President of Magnolia Society and will move up into the President's position. <coughs> Next to him is Andrew Bunting, who has just left. He's Scott Arboretum. He was our President for four years. Um, very helpful to me with the journal. He got a lot of articles for me, very interesting ones. Um, and the next, no, and this is Dr. Durr, Mike Durr, whom some of you have heard of. Um, so really nice gathering. After the meeting was over, we had the chance to do some private touring uh, of our own, and one of the gardens that we visit, were able to visit if we wanted to was that of, of Anita and Dick Figler. Dick is kind of the godfather at the moment of the Magnolia Society. He is um, the go-to guy for everybody. He is actually the world's foremost authority on Magnolia. And so he is also our science advisor, and I work very closely with him for uh, producing the journal. His wife, Anita, deals with all the logistics for our meetings, so we couldn't do without either one of them. His garden is very interesting. There is nothing in it but magnolias and two palm trees. <laughs> Think he's crazy? <laughs> Magnolia crazy. So one of the privileges of working with the, um, as, as the um, editor of the Magnolia Journal is that I get to talk to people from all over the world. And a woman from Vladivostok, I was put in touch with her last fall, and she said in an email to me, hey, would you like some seeds? I'm like, well, yeah, who wouldn't? So she, she said, well, I'll send you some seeds from our arboretum then. I waited and waited and waited. Finally, I emailed her, emailed her and said, when were you sending them? And she said, well, they should be there in a couple of weeks. So she didn't talk to me in October about this. And finally, a couple of weeks after Christmas, they arrived. Um, Beautiful packaging, all the correct paperwork, and this paperwork had to be stapled to the outside of the envelope as well as to the inside. Uh, cleaned all the seeds, and so now I have them stratifying in my crisper and refrigerator, um, and we'll see how they do. I don't know because Gladwell stocks a slightly different climate than ours, but I think they'll be okay. Um, so as I said, I've worked with people from Cuba, Colombia, Kiev, all over. So it got me thinking because I had a lot of trouble getting emails from the man in Cuba. In the end, I actually had to do it through Dick Figler. Um, 
he would get an email and forward it to me. That was the only way we could correspond for a little while. Am I on the CIA's watch list? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I hope they enjoy learning about magnolias because I also deal with people from all over the rest of the world. And at the current moment, there are at least 232, I think, with Sinostomata, probably 233 now, maybe more that I don't know about. <coughs> a lot of exploration going on. So I hope the CIA has learned a lot about magnolias if they're watching. <laughs> Why should we grow magnolias? What's the appeal? Well, for, I think that for most of us, and, and it doesn't matter whether you're a scientist who's researching their DNA or whether you're a home gardener, the beauty of the blossom, absolutely stunningly beautiful. This is a cultivar from Bill Smith, the man I told you about in um, Richmond, that um, still has some things that grew his kitchen, but, <laughs> but um, most of them are now farmed out. And this one was farmed out to my garden. It won't be released. And we'll get into a little bit about that later, but there are particular criteria that, that breeders look for. And this didn't meet those criteria, but I'm certainly not taking it out of my garden. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely gorgeous. It blooms all summer off and on. It's really cold tolerant. I actually think this could be used to back breed uh, for some cold, cold tolerance. Uh, but it doesn't have a scent. He didn't think much of the, the um, formation of the flower. I think it's lovely. My neighbors like it, so it'll stay. Um, sensation. How could you not like sensation? It blooms after the frost. It's a gorgeous yellow um, with a pink flush to the base. A really super flower. How could you not like a Japanese maple against the, the yellowing leaves of Mac Magnolia macrophylla, which has banana sized leaves almost? They can get three feet long at least, foot and a half wide in ideal conditions, and they form a gorgeous background, and I look forward to this scene every November. And then there are other times that, that magnolias are just beautiful, seen under the snow, their buds form in the fall and grow during the winter, so you'll see these fuzzy little, like catkin, and not catkins, like um, pussy willow type things, on the um, branches, and just covered in snow. It's really, really lovely, and of course, most of us use the leaves of Magnolia grandiflora for our Christmas decorations or holiday decorating. We can also grow them because Bambi and his family don't eat them. The, the fawns may take a nibble, but very quickly they learn they really don't like magnolias. However, what they do like to do, unfortunately, is rub the velvet off their horns in the fall, and they will break off magnolias. They're a little bit Magnolias are a little bit brittle, so they will break them off. The other thing they do is um, they'll scrape the bark or, or try to break them off to claim territory, mark their territory during rutting season, which is right about now. Mm -hmm. So we have to be a little cagey in my garden. Mm -hmm. And these are some magnolia um, modii that I got from the, um, from the arboretum here. I bought five of them to put in as a hedge, and we put these in cages so that they don't rub them or, or break them off until they're much bigger. If you are interested in perfumes or um, cosmetics, magnolias are actually in, uh, a really nice ingredient. Most magnolias have either a very citrusy smell or a very sweet <laughs> smell. So Sarah Jessica Parker put her name to Covet Perfume and it's made from Magnolia levifolia, and um, Crabtree and Evelyn, among others, use Magnolia liliaflora to scent part of their, uh, some of their products. They're also used as a food source. In China and Japan in particular, um, again, David's picture, and he told me that he had, that their group had gone to a tea production plantation and they had witnessed the whole process. And then they went into the shop. So he said everything in the shop that was sold had this beautiful drawing of Magnolia Beyond the Eye on all the products that were for sale. So um, in other places, Magnolia leaves are used to wrap food in, much like we would use maybe a fig leaf. Um, and they use Magnolia Beyond the Eye buds for tea. 
not camellia, in this particular part of southwest China. Mm. Food for the soul. We all need that as well as practical. And so last year, Kew Gardens and the Royal Horticulture Society commissioned a, an our botanical artist named Barbara Uzirali to do, she, I don't know how many she did, but they published about 125, I think, drawings that she did of magnolias and sold this as um, last summer it came out. It is a beautiful, beautiful book. The head of the RHS, Jim Gardner, did some of the text, and the retired head of Polly Hill Arboretum, um, Mr. Spalmer, did, did some of the text as well. Another artist that I have come to know through the Magnolia Society, her name is Emily Ross, RMZ, has done a one-woman show in New York just recently of nothing but magnolia fruit pods. And she's done a tremendous job with them. It's amazing, absolutely beautiful. She grew up in Chapel Hill, fell in love with magnolia <coughs> and before she said she played in a tree near her um, home for years and then realized that as an artist, she, she really appreciated the fruit uh, of them. I put magnolia grandifolia in here as another purpose for using magnolias. They're, they're being used a lot in medical research. There are two oils that scientists are extracting to use. Magnolia grandifolia has been used for rheumatism, malaria, and um, high blood pressure medicines. It's all, it and other magnolias are being used for cancer research, Alzheimer's, and um, respiratory diseases. A, one of the key uh, researchers that I communicate with tells me that he is working on cancer and has actually gotten to the stage of using lab rats. So uh, I, I haven't talked to him for about a year now, so I don't know where he is with that, but at least magnolias are being used for cancer research, and he seems well on his way to finding something. I put mag magnolia macrophylla, which is a, a native of the southeastern U.S. as is Grandiflora, um, because it's it's listed as critically endangered. Also, it doesn't set seed very well. So um, where you see growing groups of these, count yourself very lucky. We in North Carolina have three or four populations of them. Wake County has uh, two populations. Franklin County has a population, uh, other than my garden, and. I, Guilford County has one, and I think there's one a little bit further west. There are not very many in, um, of these in, left in, in the U.S. So conservation is a big part of our work with the uh, Magnolia Society. And uh, the flower on this is just stunningly beautiful. It's like a big chalice. Unfortunately, it only opens, it opens and closes and is dead in a couple of days. But while it's there, it is absolutely stunningly beautiful, and it is uh, quite nicely scented. And when you look into it, to me, anyway, um, I have a pretty good imagination, I guess, but I can look back and see where maybe when Tyrannosaurus rex was roaming 64 million years ago, maybe this was one of the magnolias that he bumped up against, who knows? But magnolias are carbon dated to 64 to 68 million years ago and Tyrannosaurus rex was flying around the earth at that time. So magnolias are pretty old, they've adjusted pretty well. And magnolia stellata, which a lot of us are familiar with, it's, it's one of the ones that is in the, in the marketplace, um, at least some of the cultivars are. I put it here to represent the breeding work that is being done because a lot of uh, breeding work, of course, is being done and, and species are being crossed and back crossed and what have you to get some of the nicest cultivars we have. So those are some of the reasons that we might grow magnolia. So what grows in our gardens here in the southeast? Well, it turns out a lot of those 232 magnolias will grow here. However, what I've done is included magnolias that are maybe not easily found in the trade, but if you search hard enough, you can either buy them online or in, in some local nurseries. Um, David Parks at Camellia Forest over in Chapel Hill is a good source. He doesn't list them in his catalog or online, but if you go over to the nursery, you will find quite a, a 
a good variety of magnolias. We'll start in the winter, and this is Magnolia zinii, a little bit closer up than that one that you saw in southwest China. And this was taken here in the Arboretum. This is Magnolia biondii. It's blooming now, and it's up here in the, in the, near the necessary. And there is a cultivar that David is carrying at Camellia Forest that a local uh, Chapel Hill man named Tom Kornitsky, who's a member of the Arboretum actually, um, has released. This one's common name is Hope of Spring. Another good reason to grow magnolias. A magnolia stellata is probably the one that we, we have first in our gardens and, and many of our gardens if we have magnolias at all. They, this is um, Royal Star, which is pretty easy to find in, in many nurseries. Um, starts blooming in early March, sometimes late February if the weather is good enough. Chrysanthemum floral, which is Mark's favorite, and up here in the arboretum. And Centennial, and I haven't by any means put all the uh, Magnolia stellatas in here, but these are ones that are really lovely um, and are good representation. Magnolia Centennial has one of the strongest scents of all magnolias. It's really, really fragrant. It's a fairly tall, narrow tree as well, so it's good in a small garden. You want something upright. Magnolia Lobneri um, is actually a cross between Cobus and Stellata. And this is one of the oldest tried and true. This is Leonard Messel. Another one is a white one called Merrill. And Lobneris are being um, developed more and more. And so uh, this is Leonard Messel in a, in a na natural setting. This is in a private garden and it faces southeast. You'd almost think you were in China, if you saw this and you didn't know where you were. It's a, about a 25, 30 foot tree and about that wide as well now. Mm -hmm. White Rose, I had to include this because of the theme for the, <laughs> for the Arboretum this year. Um, and this is a relatively new release. <clears throat> Excuse me. David is carrying this. And uh, you can also get this from Song Sparrow Nursery. They grow, they're in uh, Illinois, you can mail order it, and they grow all their plants on their own roots. So you don't have, a, you don't have to worry about a cobus, which is what we usually graft ours to in this area. You don't need to worry about a cobus suddenly taking over and you lose your magnolia to the cobus. Um, and it's Valentine's Day, folks. If you need to buy a Valentine, order them white rose magnolia. Something they'll have for years. Many of these overlap in the spring, and so you've got on the um, far left here, Magnolia stellata, not a particularly good color, but um, anyway. Next to it are two of the Little Girls series, Magnolia Solangiana. Magnolia Solangiana is a cross between, um, let's cheat here, Ten Genudata and Lilia flora. And this was developed in the 1760s. So this is a very old, Solangiana is a very, very old cross and but the little girl series was developed by uh, two researchers at the National Arboretum in the 1950s and they released eight of these and they named them after one of the researchers female family members so the first one in the middle is Anne and the next one is Betty Betty and Jane which I'll show you in a minute are two of the most common ones available and you will see them along various roadsides and along exits and entry ramps to uh, various interstates. The DOT uses them a lot, which is nice. And it's the most deeply col colored, uh, sort of an almost reddish purple. Betty up close, nice purple color, bitone. Ricky, I think this is Ricky. I, I, Pretty sure it is. I lost the tag, or the deer walked away with it, whatever. <laughs> um, and but I've, I've done a little research. I've talked to some people, and they all tell me that um, they have these at the National Arboretum. So I talked to one of the people who work up there. That was at one of our Magnolia Societies, and I said, "Is Ricky, you know, a nice oval-shaped tree?" And he said, "Oh yeah." I said, "Got it." So I don't have all eight of them. I have five. I did meet somebody last year who does have all eight in the Midwest. 
This is Jane. Unfortunately, these bloom in March, so they often get caught by frost. But once they're mature enough to have a lot of bloom, frost will kill the ones in bloom, yes, but you'll also have a lot more coming along after the frost uh, goes away. So thankfully, they are not open yet this weekend. John John is, um, a, is also a Solangiana, but it was developed by um, Todd Gresham. And Gresham, you'll hear a lot about Gresham hybrids in the Magnolia world. He developed or, or bred for large, up to 12 inches wide, magnolia blossoms. And you can't miss them. I mean, you can see them quite a ways away. Most of his are in, the, in shades of pink or pink and white. This one is Frank's masterpiece. This is another um, magnolia that was developed by a man named Frank Galen. And he released this and he thought it was his best. It's really beautiful. Again, very big bloom, but he was going for the darker, brighter colors. This is another one of my favorites. This is um, March Till Frost, and it starts in March, literally a big, fairly good bloom on the tree then. But there is a flower on that tree all summer, and it is a beautiful kind of um, reddish, purpley blossom. But notice that in that teeple, <coughs> there is some blue as well. And by the way, magnolias don't have petals. They have teeples because they're, they never f developed true petals. Um, and in fact, their, their development preceded bees. So they're actually pollinated by beetles, <laughs> even to this day. Bees may pollinate some, but mostly it's done by beetles at night. But what I liked about this is, is the leaves because they're a little bit more rounded, they're wavy, undulating, and if you look up, they have this gorgeous red veining in them, and you can see the bloom on that. And it really does take a good, hard frost in the fall for them to stop blooming. It is deciduous, by the way. Then we have some really small ones. This is Minnie Mouse. This is actually a lily floral, but it's uh, in the spring, I have to admit, a lot of people don't like the color. And it's pretty dull purple. But later in the summer, on the right, you've got this much pinker bloom and a better, I guess, it must like heat. And the foliage is as clean as a whistle. There's no diseases, no problems with it at all. And it, it grows in this sort of round shape. And it's about three, four and a half feet maybe. And it shouldn't get any taller than that. It re-blooms twice a year often. So it's a, it's a good one to have. And it would go well in a container for those of you that do landscape uh, design. Another dwarf is Kiki's Broom, and it stays two to two and a half feet uh, tall and wide. So again, another one that's a really good one for a container. <coughs> On my wish list is Magnolia Denudata Forest Pink, which we have here in the Arboretum. Uh, normally Denudatas are white, so this pink that was developed is really, really beautiful, and I want one. Um, Coach had a question for all of us magnolia, quote, experts that were visiting his garden. He had this gorgeous big magnolia. Uh, the flowers were way up in the tree, and it did take several attempts to get them down, get one down. Um, and nobody really wanted to say what they thought it was, I guess. I had no idea. But Dick said he, Dick Figler said he thought it was aggression just based on the size of it. Not a particularly good color picture here, but it's, it's got a little bit of light pink in it and a darker pink at the bottom. But if you think of his hands holding that bloom, that's a huge blossom. And you could clearly see it 20 feet up in the air. The gentleman over here, Aaron Shetler, he is the ground, head groundskeeper over here at Meredith College. And if you want to see magnolias used in a garden setting, go across the street because he has a wonderful collection he got a really good grant, and he's been planting them in hedges and en masse, and, and they are really beautiful. When they're young, Magnolia macrophylla and Magnolia tripetala are, they're both big leaved and they're very similar, so the easy way to tell them apart is looking at, at the leaf. So this one has a heart-shaped leaf, and Magnolia tripetala, the leaf is straight into the into the branching. 
Magnolia tripetal is called the umbrella magnolia because it has these beautiful walls of leaves and then this bloom in the center of it. Again, very short leaf blossom, but very beautiful, very fragrant. And the seed pods are quite good sized on it. And to show you perspective of size, Kevin Paris in this picture is a good six foot one, two, looks like a quarter pack in build. He's a big guy. And this magnolia is really large. This is in West Virginia. He and some friends were botanizing up in a um, West Virginia gorge. Uh, one of my favorites, but one of the ones that for me is kind of hard to grow. And you'll see the back of the leaf. Well, it's because the blossom dangles underneath these leaves and you have to kind of be a midget and look up at them. Mm -hmm. So for short people like me, that's fine. Um, but what you can do is also plant them in a raised bed and put a bench underneath it because again, they're beautiful when they bloom. This is about June probably for us and um, they do last a few days and beautiful, beautiful scent. I put the yellows in a separate category because it was such a breakthrough in the 1960s. A lady by the name of Laura uh, Kurting at Brooklyn Botanic Garden used Magnolia acuminata, which is another native American magnolia, and everybody scoffed at her. All the breeders at the time, they thought she was ridiculous using Magnolia acuminata. It doesn't look like anything when it blooms. It's not a particularly pretty tree. The, the fruit pot on it has kind of a cucumber look to it, which is how it got its common name, cucumber magnolia. But she per persisted. In the end, she got this beautiful yellow flower. And they bloom after frost, usually. So they start blooming about April time, mid-April. This is Butterflies. This was her second release. Her first release was Elizabeth. And here in the southeast, Elizabeth is a little bit more creamy and a little less yellow, but it is clearly not white. So uh, it truly was a breakthrough, and even here you can tell the difference. Color, this color is, I think, a little brighter because I took it up north uh, where the colors seem to pop a little more. This is Lois, and it was named after one of the boards of directors uh, heads at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. This is Sun Sprite. There are two very narrow, tall ones. This only gets a couple of feet wide, 8 to 12 feet tall. Uh, so again, if you're trying to plant something in a very narrow space, this is a fantastic one. The, the drawback to the yellows is they do not repeat bloom. Once they bloomed in the spring, that's it. But they are really, really gorgeous. So mixing them in with some others is a great idea. This one was developed by Tom Kronitsky, also in Chapel Hill, and he called this one Sleeping Beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Camellia Forest is carrying it. Um, then they got into more of the golds, and so you'll have a lot of gold cop, gold whatever. Um, and, but this one actually is called Judy Zook, because Laura Curring developed it and named it after the president of Brooklyn Botanic Garden. You wouldn't necessarily know it from this picture, but this is also the result of some yellow breeding and then some crossback breeding. And this is Daybreak. This is Coral Lake, which we have outside the Arboretum here. You can look at these flowers in the morning when they break bud. You can look at them two hours later. You can look at them every hour during the day, and they will be a different color. Mm -hmm. the, the, the flower, um, the, the color just sort of oozes into different colors throughout the, the temples throughout the day. Absolutely stunning flowers. Um, pretty long lasting as well. So these, these are two that I have in my garden. So let's move on to the evergreens that we can grow here. This was taken at Duke Gardens. This is Magnolia grandiflora. And it's so old that it's a beautiful architectural structure. And where the roots, or where the branching rather, have actually touched the ground, they've rooted. Wow. So you can actually root magnolias. It's well, not quite as easy as that, but uh, you can do it. And going back to winter, here in the Arboretum, we have uh, Magnolia maudii, which is one of my favorites because it, it's evergreen, the, the flowers are nicely scented, it blooms in the winter, um, 
and it is a sort of a gray green, almost bluish leaf. Very, very attractive. This one will take a little more shade. Uh, the next evergreen to bloom is the banana shrub. How many of you are familiar with this? Good. It smells like bananas? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And this is our typical yeah. color. Mm -hmm. This is the typical bud in the winter. So if you're gardening with children, this is a great uh, plant to grow because it's, it's got so many interests throughout this, the um, four seasons. The buds are so much fun to watch grow. Uh, there's a purple one called Blush. Fairy blush. This was released by um, Mark Jury in New Zealand, and the leaves look like they have scale on them. It's not. <laughs> they. Uh, this is pine pollen that just hadn't washed off yet. Uh, the flowers are about the same size as the banana shrub that some of you are familiar with. Uh, not as banana scented, fruity, but not not quite like a banana. Another tree that is very popular and a native to the United States is the Bay Magnolia, or Magnolia virginiana. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the, this is one that will take shade, and it will take a lot of moisture. This will grow in, on the edges of swamps, and does in its native habitat. However, it does really well in an ordinary garden setting, too. Um, I don't know who developed it, but Moon Glow on the, on the far uh, right here was it hit the horticultural world with a big bang because of the leaves, the back of the leaves. So when you've got a storm coming and you have this in your garden, you get this beautiful flash of silver. Really, really pretty. So Moon Glow, and it has been used in back crossing as well for different uh, Magnolia virginianas. This is another Magnolia virginia and it's a lot more dense in form. It eventually will get 15 feet tall, about eight feet wide. Flowers a lot is released by a breeder in Tennessee, and it is called its tra its cultivar name registered is Perry Page, but the <laughs> common name or the trademark name is um, different. It's on your list. Sweet Fang. Sweet Fang. Anyway. It is, it, you actually hear this, even though it's got a trademark name, you actually hear this called Perry Page more than you hear it by the trademark name. Uh, we were talking about Magnolia Lebefolia in, um, in perfumes, and this is Michelle. Michelle is in our Arboretum Gardens at the beginning of the, of the long border, and it blooms about June, and May, yeah, May, sorry, May, and it is really heavy blooming, and it's very fragrant, lovely. This is Michelle, which was uh, released and named by Tony Avon in honor of his um, first wife, late wife. This is Magnolia and Cygnus, which I cannot get to call them. They usually bloom white, so this, this sort of reddish one, this is in a private garden in Greensboro. Again, very, very unusual. Magnolia grandiflora, which most of us know is the big southern magnolia. Little Gem was one of the first new ones that was very popular. JC planted three of them, some of you may remember, out in the winter garden, thought it would make a nice hedge. They were thought at the time to be dwarfs. Um, no. In 10 years, they'll grow to 20 feet, and slowly after that, they will reach 30 to 40 feet. However, they do bloom at a very young age, so maybe three, four years old, you will have blooms on this. Uh, seed pot on the, on the left. Kevin Paris released um, a magnolia to honor his mother, Kay Paris. It's a shorter one, it's more compact, pyramidal in size, and it is um, a good bloomer also, and to repeat bloom throughout the summer. Has a lot of the back, the fuzz is called <coughs> indumentum, and this has a really good indumentum on the back. So it's kind of a good, good tree on all scores. Gets only about 15 feet wide at the base. Alta is another popular magnolia used in hedging. If you get to the Atlantic Botanic Garden, there's a beautiful hedge of altas um, in back of a seating area which faces a, a um, water feature. So more columnar, uh, probably 15 to 20 feet on this one. 
So how many of us want to grow either the next new plant or push the envelope? Um, I'm, I know most of you do. So I thought I'd throw in this section on what's coming next. Well, this is um, a lot of breeding is going on, of course, and Bill Smith is one of the breeders in the eastern United States that's well known. This is one that he thought he was going to release. Most breeders give them at least three years to find out what the true characteristic of the flower is going to be. And he, he was so excited because this had kind of a peachy pink to it. And he had a name all picked out for it when he released it. Well, by the third year, it was way big, it flopped, it didn't have a good scent. He cut it. So it's not going to be released. But there, are a lot of, there is a lot of work going on in the breeding world. Uh, this is one of his yellows that probably will be released. I put this in because this is still, this is actually on the market. This is called Vulcan. It came from the Jury um, Farm in uh, New Zealand. It's the closest thing to red. Right now, the holy grail for color in Magnolia is a true red. Um, and this is the closest that they've gotten to it so far. Uh, another Bill Smith's been looking for big flowers, um, different colors, perfumes. Mm. Yes. I heard some oohs. The first time I saw this, I, I just drooled, and it was immediately at the top of my wish list. Wow. What is Vance it? Hooper is out of New Zealand. His breeding work is to get seed to flower within three years. Genie succeeded. It was the first magnolia to come out, a deciduous magnolia, to bloom within three years. So he's worked a lot with this, uh, has a very tight Black seed flower is a very heavy bloomer, well branched, shrubby magnolia, not particularly tall, probably eight or ten feet at the most. Good one for a small garden. From the breeding program using Genie in bat crosses, he got Cameo. And I asked him what the story on Cameo, the name was. This is only just released, so uh, you're among the first to see this. And it is being grown by a breeder, uh, by a grower in Tennessee who's bought the rights for growing it in the United States. And I saw him at the trade show in January. He said it'll probably be a couple of years before this is on the market because he's got to build up his numbers. But Vance told me that the reason he named this cameo was because when he first saw it, he said, yeah, I kind of like it. And he said, in my mind, it made a cameo appearance. I didn't think I was going to do much with it. Three years later, this is what he had. And he said, gee, this bloomed within th three years, um, and it's this big in five? Very sellable. So he named it Cameo and has released it. He's also working with miniatures. So this is Mickey Mouse. And Mickey Mouse, if you think of the tip of a pen, you can see how big that bloom is going to be, not very big. It's available now, but it's really, really hard to find. I don't know, in Canada, I know where I could get it, but then I'd have to ship it in. So I don't know if it's available yet in the United States. But it will be soon. And he tells me this grows to about three feet. This bloomed in a year and a half from the seed. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> well, because a lot of us are growing in containers, what he did was take it and grafted it on to, to some high grafts on rootstock that they use in New Zealand so that he could sell them as potted plants for a container gardening, which I'm sure will catch on here as well. Uh, within the Grandifloros and other magnolias, of course, variegated leaves are a big deal. Unfortunately, with Grandiflora, nobody's been able to release one yet because they haven't found one that the leaves hold the color state in a stable form, but it's coming. Uh, more work is being done with the uh, Magnolia Figos. This happens to be Magnolia Figo variety Skinneriana. It's also a Bill Smith hybrid cross. Uh, the grower who has this is um, a friend of mine who said he didn't care whether it ever bloomed or not. It was growing in really dark shade. At three years old, it was a pyramid about four feet tall, and the glossy leaves were just glowing. And I said, yeah, sure. So I went over and looked at it, and he was absolutely right. So the, the flowers were very insignificant. A couple of years ago, I said to him, oh, hey, how's that skin rain you've got doing? And he said, well, you know what? The flowers are bigger, 
they're scented now? He said, I'm definitely going to talk to Bill about releasing this. So I said, well, same one for me. Uh, the juries in New Zealand have released this series that their marketer, Tesla, in the United States told them they had to give a particular brand name to, so they named it the Fairy Series. Um, <clears throat> you saw Fairy Blush earlier. This is Fairy White, which they released last summer. They also are working with purples. <coughs> uh, Dick Figler, our science advisor, released Twiggy, which is a very tightly compacted form. He thinks, because this is an open pollination, not a hand cross, he thinks this is Magnolia elegantissima by Magnolia Figo. And it certainly has the Magnolia Figo banana shrub blossom look to it. Um, but the leaves up close, or to, I've seen this in his garden, it's beautiful, are slightly twisted and they're very small. So this is going to make another nice small evergreen plant for our gardens. It's being propagated by um, Ethan Guthrie at the Atlantic Botanic Garden. Some of the Chinese um, and Asian magnolias that are coming in are, I think, also going to be eventually released into the market. This is Magnolia chanquintensis. Um, and it's beautiful, I think, if it never blossomed. It's an evergreen, look at the red in the, in the leaves of the pigment of that. So I think this is going to be a real winner. Um, Dick is trialing it in his, his garden, so once he has had it for a few years and we see how it does, I uh, hope this gets released. A lot of work is being done with Magnolia virginiana for different growth habits, different blooming patterns, different sizes of blooms, including variegated foliage. Magnolia uyunensis, which is out here behind the, um, the stack, or actually the side of the stack building. Again, it's one that in native habitat usually is white. We have the pink form, which is a really rare. Um, it does set some seed, so we'll see how that does. I hope it's released. Uh, this is a magnolia called um, Magnolia. I can never remember this one. Compressor. 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 Mark brought back three seeds from a trip he did to Taiwan um, three years ago, I think, and three of them. Uh, actually grew, or he brought back more than that, but he, three suits <coughs> grew, and he put one in an um, auction when we had the Magnolia Study Day a year and a half ago, and I bought one of them. So I'm not sure which I'm going to get, because apparently there are two varieties and within the Magnolia Journal. We, they were separated and named by Mr. Chen, who is with the Forest Department in Taiwan. So this is Louis Luanensis. And Bill McNamara, who Chris told you about at Quarry Hill Gardens, has this one from China. Um, and what Quarry Hill does is they, they take everything wild collected seed, yes, but the idea is to put it back into, the, into its native habitats where it can be grown again. Kevin Parents in uh, South Carolina is doing an awfully lot with hand crossing between species. So this is a list of the ones that he had for our meeting last year. And you get some really interesting seed pods, as well as blooms. And then um, Cliff Parks over in Chapel Hill, David's father, crossed Magnolia Ligifolia with Magnolia Maudii and got this rather nice, open, shrubby, uh, although it's on a single trunk, but a shrubby look to it, uh, with lots of beautiful buds. This is three, three years old, so it should bloom this spring. Can't wait to see what it looks like. I love the leaves because it reminds me of the Mardi Eye. And I'm going to leave you with a picture of Magnolia Salonciana at the first ever Park Cemetery, which is Mount Auburn Cemetery in um, one of the Boston suburbs up north, which I suppose is probably under 20 feet of snow. Um, but in March, the magnolias and the cherries are out, and even on a rainy day, believe me, it was raining that day, this magnolia just glowed. Okay. 
So if you would like to join the Magnolia Society and learn even more, get some unusual magnolias, meet some wonderful people, and travel all over the world, you can do so by joining the Magnolia Society by going online to the .org website. And there's a great resource tool there for all kinds of things as well. I did bring some brochures tonight. I only have three. So you can join by the old-fashioned paper method too. Thank you. Are there any questions for Cheryl? Got all your questions asked during our little intermission that we had, I guess? Yes. Well, I guess so. Well, thank you very much, Cheryl. Oh, we have one question over here. I bought a magnolia at Homewood Nursery. Um, this is the second winter I've had it. I think it was Unanensis? Unanensis. And it was supposed to be white and like a brown color. And it's three and a half feet tall. That would be Labifolia. Yeah, I was going to say. Unanensis is a, an obsolete name. Okay. It, it was um, Michaelia unanensis. Okay. Originally, and they relumped the, reclassified the magnolia. Yeah. The, the other thing about magnolias is that they have just, in 2004, <coughs> Dick Figler and Hans Newbaum took all the sections of magnolia, which they had proved by DNA were related, and so they lumped them all under the name, the genus name of magnolia. So where we used to call the banana shrub Michaelia figo, it's now Magnolia Figo. Um, and the same thing with Magnolia Figo. The other thing they've done, and that's a particular mm -hmm. one, Unidensis was something else before that. And so it's had three name changes in 10 years. So you've got a Magnolia Levifolia, and yes, there are some that are sort of ground covers, and it will flower really prolifically for you when it's established. So it's going to take a while to flower all yeah. Probably about. Yeah. No, it I, if it was if it was word. vegetatively grown, was it named one? It had a name. I can't remember it. Okay, if it had a name, it's probably going to flower within. It'll probably, it might flower this year. Does it have little brown buds on it? It it okay. This is the second winter. Yeah. Um, it flowered last yeah. spring mm -hmm. early. I thought There's it was supposed couple. to flower in the summer, but it flowered. They flower early. For very us. early, but just a, just a couple three blooms mm -hmm. and. Um, it, they, it. They're very prolific. Yeah. Which, um, Magnolia Michelle, which you'll see here, in a, you showed a picture of, and I have the same picture here. Um, for instance, Michelle will put at every leaf on a, or about, I mean, you could have 16 leaves, and in each node, in each leaf, there'll be a bud. Okay. On Labifolia, a lot of times. So it is going to be it's awesome. It's very prolific. Oh, yeah. very awesome. Yeah. Okay, yes. good. Cool. They smell nice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. And it smells good. Yeah. Good. Here, Any other questions for Cheryl? Doesn't look like it. Well, thank you very much, Cheryl.